Thanks so much, Doug. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to CAFC's Senior Financial Leaders Network webinar series. Today's presentation is the second um, in this particular series. And it's entitled, NICU Team Growth with Financial Savings. We're absolutely thrilled that you can join us today. And uh, uh, today's presentation, I know, is going to be of great interest and learning for all of us. Just before we start off, to give you just a little bit of background of, of, of this particular series, opportunities around sharing and seeking best practices in many different areas of infant, child, and youth health service delivery continue to be a frequent undertaking of many individuals from uh, CAPC's member organizations. As a commitment to all of our members, um, CAPC is very pleased to serve as your, and I really want to emphasize your communication broker, by facilitating many different venues and opportunities for us to share best practices across our child and youth healthcare community. Over the past many months, um, a group of senior financial leaders and health administrators, practitioners from across Canada have created an informal network with the mandate and vision to share best business and financial practices and the impact of those best practices on clinical care and, of course, ultimately patient health outcomes. We're going to expand this opportunity for sharing best practices across CAFC's national network through quarterly webinars. The next one will be scheduled in September 2011, and we'll be sending out um, information about that in the next couple of weeks. Today, it is my absolute pleasure and honor to welcome and to thank our colleagues um, from the IWK Health Center in Halifax who will be presenting on the neonatal care team model changes. And these are changes that have been implemented over the last couple of years. And uh, our presenters today are going to be Kate Lively. Uh, Kate is the Women's and Newborn Health Resource and Allocation Manager at the IWK. Heather Simons, who is the Project Lead Models of Care, also at the IWK. And uh, Kate and Heather will be joined um, by their co-presenter, Jocelyn Fine, who is the Vice President of Patient Care at the IWK. Um, and to, uh, to Kate and Heather and Jocelyn, thank you so much for your presentations today and also for the work that you've done in preparing for today's webinar. Before we turn things over to our speakers, it is really another pleasure and honor for me to welcome and introduce our financial network chair, and that is Alan Horsburgh, who is the Senior Vice President of Finance at the IWK. Um, and uh, Alan is a very active leader in many of CAFC's activities and national programs. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you, Alan, to the webinar and to turn things over to you um, to, to bring a few thoughts of your own to this subject and then to turn over to our speakers. Thank you very much, Elaine. And I'll be very quick on the introductions here. Um, this, as Elaine indicated early on, is the second in what we hope becomes a, a long list of uh, future sharing of best practices from a patient care and a resource perspective. Uh, several of us from the CAFC organizations who have to manage the challenging resource issues uh, got together and thought it would be a great idea to share uh, some of the learnings that we've each been through on individual initiatives because we certainly know from across Canada we're all being challenged to do more with less resources, both dollars and human resources and time and effort and everything. So we figured, uh, as we're all under the gun, why not look across the country and then just share with one another some successes that we've had. We had the Alberta experience on our uh, inaugural kickoff, which was absolutely wonderful, and they shared some wonderful things for all of us to keep uh, an eye on and, and look at. And today, here at the IWK, we have our team that has been through some very innovative uh, changes in our neonatal intensive care unit. So we hope to share uh, the experiences here from the lessons learned and, and all of that and hope that it's of value 
to everyone who's on the on the line and on the webinar. And I would encourage everyone as well, if any one of you have some uh, fantastic experiences of change that you have undergone and has made a difference in a positive way in patient care while well, using the resources uh, you do have in a very uh, effective manner, drop them off to Elaine or myself and uh, we will reach out and, and look to you to help us provide maybe one of the next ones and, and share some of your best practices. So that's really the goal, and to make it uh, absolutely this centered around the patient, but uh, how we use our resources wisely to do the best we can for this population. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Jocelyn and, and Heather and Kate to uh, kick off today's session. Hello, everyone. This is Heather speaking. Um, Kate and I will kind of be popping back and forth throughout the presentation, so you'll hear some changes in voices. And we're gonna, okay, we're over to Heather. Okay, if we're ready to go. Um, so Kate and I will be jumping back and forth a little bit, and you'll hear the different voices, and we are going to, as mentioned, talk about the neonatal care team model changes, kind of uh, our investment, our return investment, and in the changes we've made there. So if we flip to the next slide, and we're going to talk a little bit about the background of what um, contributed to our move forward with this, the drivers for the health system transformation. So there were a number, both provincially and with this particular unit. So provincially, there was a provincial review uh, that was released in January 2008 that informed provincial changes uh, in regards to how we provide care. The province has been working in the same model of care delivery for over 20 years and was struggling to meet patient population needs. So it was recognized that transformational change would be required to address the fiscal and human resource reality that we're in while striving to improve the health status of Nova Scotians. And that we know in Nova Scotia in particular that we have an aging and declining population and that we have poor health status for Nova Scotians on all age levels, right from pediatrics up to our seniors. And then both provincially and in the NICU, we have increasing demands for health services. So we have had a number of times uh, over the last couple of years where we reached capacity within our NICU as we have health human resource challenges. Now, we're in a little bit of a different situation here at the IWK in that there's people that um, like to come to work to IWK, it's very appealing, whereas some places in the province we have up to a 40% vacancy rate in some units. That's not our case here, but we have seen changes in that areas that we used to be able to say we want staff with a certain number of years of experience. Um, now, we are taking people right from the program. So we're seeing now that areas that we used to be able to ask for a certain number of years of experience and have a stack of applicants to an incident where we're having to take people right from their educational programs or sometimes postings that don't get filled immediately and we have to leave up until they're filled. So that has been a change for us. So there are health human resource challenges as well as sustainability, both with our money, our people, and our infrastructure. Um, so we're going to go on to the next slide, and we're going to talk about some of the key concepts around models of care. Um, and that is around optimizing scope of practice of all our health care providers. So we look at the whole team in regards to optimizing their practice and their uh, scope of practice. Uh, we use the right person for the right work for the, at the right time for the right outcomes for the patient and family are central to the care team. We have streamlined processes using evidence-based practices. We use optimizing interprofessional teamwork. There's identification and implementation of technology to support excellent patient care. There's sharing of information across the continuum of health care. And there's implementation of processes that support efficiency and cost-effective healthcare delivery. So these are the key concepts that we use as we implement. So next, if you want to turn the slide, you should actually see the collaborative care model. So this I know is specific to the province, but this is our provincial collaborative care model that came out of our provincial work with the implementation of models of care. So this is actually a framework to look at the patient population and how we provide care. So it places the patient and the family as central to the team, and it looks at the patient population needs against four change levers. So those four change levers are the circles that surround the patient and family. They're people, process, 
information and technology. And then it's recognized that if we're going to make changes in any of those four change levers, that we have to ensure that there's the four critical supports. So we have to have ongoing staff development and mentorship. We have to have strong and effective communication, committed and supportive leadership, and collaboration across the continuum. When we looked at some of the changes that need to be made, if we didn't have those four critical supports, which is why we talk about investment, because you have to invest in those four critical supports, then we're not successful in making our changes. So just a little bit about um, the NICU in particular, kind of a little bit of an overview. Uh, it's a 40-bed unit with a 94.6% occupancy rate in uh, fiscal year 9-10. The average daily census in 0-9-10 was 38 babies per day. Uh, average workload of hours per patient day was 11.04. For our Women's and Newborn Health Program, it had the second highest number of postings for positions. It's the highest resource allocation in the organization. It has high overtime costs, high sick time costs. It has an interprofessional staff of 153.35 FTEs. Um, those are the FTEs, so when you look at our part-time and casual people, we actually have over, around 223 staff. And the most common position is the registered nurse in that unit with 163 people in that role. Hello, it's uh, Kate here. I'm going to take over the slides for a few. Um, we started uh, the process in the neonatal unit by uh, investing and bringing in the collaborative care model. And the way we approached that was to start off with communication uh, with staff. And so what we had were open sessions that uh, focused on the interprofessional team. They were held at various times of the day. We had uh, poster displays. We did electronic communications with staff just to uh, provide them with a variety of avenues to seek information on the collaborative care model. As we met with staff, it was done mostly face-to-face -face informally. Um, our leadership was present at those meetings. Uh, and we'd ask staff to participate on the project team and become part of the planning um, for the changes in the NICU. Um, and again, uh, once the project team was in place, then the patient population was, a, was examined. And we had uh, assistance from our decision support services, industrial engineers, uh, to help us with, uh, with that group. Um, the one thing I, we haven't mentioned is who our interprofessional uh, team were, and it certainly included nursing, respiratory therapy, social work, pharmacy, child life, physicians, clinical nutrition, unit aides, and ward clerks. So we tried to make sure that we had representation from each of those groups on our project team. And then um, this is a list of the data that we, that we looked at um, to form our decision making. So we looked at patient satisfaction surveys. And, and we looked at um, overall satisfaction in 0910, and it was um, a tremendous 96% uh, satisfaction, which was great. But patients did lead us down a couple of avenues. They said we might be able to improve breastfeeding support and maybe some of the information that we give out to them. Uh, we also looked at workload measurement, and that was uh, for nursing and allied health, and, and looked at what, are, what is nursing spending their time doing each day, and uh, what are the top three things that they do for direct patient care. And um, feeding babies was one of the top things that the nurses in the NICU did. Uh, we also looked at patient population data. We uh, looked at a total of 890 patients who spent some time in the NICU uh, in 2009, 2010. And um, what was the most responsible diagnosis? Probably no surprise to people uh, in the business, but it was low birth weight. Uh, at 29%, and their average length of stay was about 17 days in, uh, in the NICU. We also had a large population that spent uh, less than 12 hours. Uh, we looked at daily clinical assignment sheets, so who are the babies that need to be cared for and uh, how are decisions made around who cares uh, for those babies. Uh, staff perception and, 
and uh, context of the workload and the work environment. We used that information, and that was mostly members of our, of our project team. We had, they had also done a patient flow study that year, and so we were able to access that information. And, uh, and then a very important part of it, of course, was admission times to the NICU and when are our babies arriving and when are they leaving to. And so uh, once we felt we had a handle on that information, um, we, made, um, we got together as a team and made some assumptions about what work did these population need that really needed to be uh, RN care provision. And uh, we came up with the list that is on your screen now, which is initial assessments and initiation of the plan of care. Uh, we also uh, said patients requiring ventilation, which uh, was about 7% of the population that went through there. Uh, any patient that had a central line, which was 17% of the patient population, and all patients requiring TPN, and again, we found in the stats for that time frame to be 26%. It's always interesting because there is always a perception with staff that some of those things are higher than they actually are. So it was really enlightening to have that in black and white and share it, share it with the staff there. Uh, we felt that all new post-operative patients for at least their first shift would need to be cared for by an RN. All the patients less than 29 weeks gestation, just because of their complexities, we wanted to keep as all our end. Um, patients on antibiotics, although we'd need to review the case, because there could be a collaborative arrangement there with another care provider. provider. And um, patients requiring complex discharge planning also would fall within our end work. Okay, we're back to me, Heather speaking. So where to from here? So the, the group got together and looked at all that data and had lots of discussion on what it meant in regards to the context of the care they provided as well as what the data was showing. And the conclusion that was reached, it was reached by consensus, and there was a meeting with uh, the core working group, but as well any team member was invited to attend as well. Um, so everyone was welcome to come and have input and have say into uh, recommendations that were being made. And what the consensus was was that data indicated that an RN, LPN, direct patient care staffing model was a viable option for our NICU based on our data. And so currently it's an RN, LPN ratio of 22 RNs and 3 LPNs 24-7. And this staffing model required considerable work to address, as you can imagine. Um, because it's a staffing mix that's not occurred in our NICU before. Um, so we needed to ensure there was role clarity and that we had everything in place to ensure there was role clarity both for staff that already existed on the unit as well as um, new staff. We had to address orientation needs. We had to address scope of practice. We had to address assignments and decision making. Um, and Kate's going to go into a little more in regards to how we did all those things a little bit further on. And we had to have recognition of the need for ongoing investment as staff competencies and scope of practice continue to develop with this group. So some of our human resource investment in this was a partnership with our Nova Scotia Community College here. That was enhanced. So we had some placements that used to occur here at the health center, but it was very limited. It was uh, restricted basically to our family newborn adult surgery unit. And uh, we worked in partnership with that community college to have practical nurses come for practicums here at the organization on different units that they'd never been before. And one of those was the NICU. Um, so that was extremely beneficial for both the students in becoming familiar with both our organization and the different units that they may come to work on, as well as for our staff to become familiar with what their scope was and get used to working with a different care provider on the team. So it was a win-win situation for both sides, really. Um, and as well, a number of those students that came for their internship actually then went on to become successful candidates and physicians on that unit. Um, we also did considerable work in the development of the orientation to meet the needs of both the new care provider and the existing staff. So we've uh, looked at the data. We've 
made our decision on our model, and now it comes to implementation. And this was huge because we were introducing another care provider in a neonatal unit that um, was stretched very close to its limits. Um, so we needed to address um, change management and create a cultural shift in the unit. And uh, it wasn't, um, the staff there are great and very open to new ideas, but not always was it embraced wholeheartedly, as I'm sure uh, participants here can imagine. So it was very important that we addressed um, issues as they arose. So if there were extremely negative comments being made, then that person uh, would meet with the manager or the team and get their questions answered and find out where their lack of knowledge was um, for what we were trying to do. Uh, they started civility and respect in the workplace session and sessions, and these are fondly called crew, and so they'd go in and do exercises with staff. Um, there was an open invitation, of course, for staff to be involved in the process and, and the ongoing process. Um, changes with this model became standing agenda items on care team meetings. And again, we used uh, multiple communication forums. So we held face-to-face -face meetings. We had poster boards. Uh, we had the clinical leaders go around to each of the sites one day and ask questions and what are the concerns that staff had uh, with these changes. And then those questions that came out of that were answered and made available to all staff members. We started um, the evaluation process very early, and it helped us to uh, direct our ongoing education needs. So we started with pre-implementation surveys of the interprofessional uh, team members. So we had a survey for nurses and one for uh, physicians, another for allied health, and another for unit aides and ward clerks. And these are some of the sample uh, survey questions from the nursing um, survey um, talking about their scope and role and are they able to work to that and are they satisfied with their job and is staff morale high in their unit? We, we uh, asked a lot of questions in that. So that was done um, very early in the process before the LPN started and then we looked at those results and thought okay the physicians needed a little more information on uh, role clarity and as did some of the nurses. So we directed our education that way. I'll pass it back to Heather. So yeah, role clarity was huge. And we know that both from literature and other areas that have undergone change, especially transformational change. Um, if in this unit in particular, but here in the organization as a whole, we've been mainly uh, completely in our end direct care providers since about 1992. And so this was huge because either um, staff had, the RNs had either not worked with another direct care provider in providing care, or for us old timers that have been here a while, had worked with a different role many years ago prior to 1992. Um, so either remembered a different relationship or had never worked with a different care provider. So we had scope of practice sessions. So we had uh, someone coming in and talked to us about optimizing practice. We also had the colleges involved in regards to uh, doing sessions in regards to full scope of practice from uh, a college perspective. We developed uh, what we called collaborative care guidelines. And where this came from was actually from the staff themselves. We had a number of outside people come and do sessions. And we said to them, what else do you need to make this successful? And what they said to us, it's great to have this knowledge, but we need something hard copy that we can refer to in the middle of the night or the weekend when we don't have those resources available. So in the collaborative care guidelines, that consisted of some definitions so that people had consistent definitions. It had information on scope of practice. It had information on collaborative care guidelines. It had information on assignments and decision making, as well as um, it had job descriptions and skills lists in it so that people could actually refer back to things. Um, we had presentations from all the disciplines on their full scope in particular on this NICU. We started this um, just with a variety of roles, respiratory therapy, clinical nutrition, 
physiotherapy, pharmacy. Um, because though the major change here has been with the, our direct care provider with the nursing, we're looking at all aspects of the team. So there may be other changes up and coming with this team. Um, this is just the first. Um, we looked at our orientation and we developed a competency-based LPN orientation for specific to their needs. And that included uh, education for the staff that was already on board in regards to what the competencies were. We had uh, we did some selective recruitment for preceptors. So we knew that um, <coughs> all our preceptors are great. There were more. There were some that were more likely to be open and receptive to a new care provider and support them in this transition. Um, so we actually targeted some preceptors and got some optimal preceptors there. And at the same time, we knew that there was only a certain amount of capacity for learning and um, supporting in the unit. So we limited our outside learners. Some, some of our, our N uh, learner placements, et cetera, we limited during the time frame that we were doing these orientations. Okay. On scope of practice, so we did engage with professional colleges around competency and collaboration questions as well. So as we did the work with each unit, numerous questions would come up. Well, can an LPN do this? Or what does this mean for the RN scope of practice when I'm working with the LPN in this situation? So we have key individuals at our colleges that are now on speed dial. Um, and they are quite comfortable with us contacting them with questions and helping support us in answering any questions that are outstanding. We followed the health center process that we have for LPN beyond entry level competencies. So as any beyond entry level competencies were developed, they went through that process for approval prior to um, than being engaged on in the unit. For assignments and decision making, we did education and mentorship with clinical staff, and that's all clinical staff, not just the nursing. So we tried to engage all the team um, so that they would know who the new care providers are, what they could do, they could have any questions answered into how they interact with those team members. We addressed uh, the collaborative care guidelines that I mentioned. Um, and we also mentioned that it's an ongoing item on staff and care team meetings. Um, and we also had a nurse collaborator role, collaborator role developed. And this was specific um, because of the patient population we had and the um, flux in uh, both acuity and census on that unit, um, as well as needing support for the LPNs that have come on board in the unit or LPNs or support for new RNs that have come on board for the unit. So this RN has um, a lighter assignment um, and is able then to support new learners on the unit in regards to collaboration. As with any transformational change, um, the process is fluid and still ongoing and adjusting all the time. Um, and education is ongoing as well. Uh, the human resource aspect, well, we uh, implemented 13 FTEs of LPNs, so there are LPNs on every shift 24-7. Uh, we utilized our human resource director um, to help us with that process and, and kept them apprised of uh, how the implementation was going through a center-wide implementation committee, so they were part of that. Uh, we obviously talked with our human resource consultants. Uh, we spoke with unions. Uh, Human Resource Department did most of that, um, ongoing updates, um, ongoing discussion with staff regarding potential and actual impacts. And then uh, we broke that orientation of 13 FTEs into two sessions and we staggered uh, the orientation process uh, because there's always ongoing orientation in the unit as well of uh, permanent RN staff. And post-implementation evaluation, well, we are continuing to evaluate the following indicators. And uh, this, again, is set up through the uh, Decision Support Service. And they have standardized a report card that includes all this information uh, for ongoing review. So that, of course, includes our patient and family satisfaction, complaints and compliments, adverse events, infection rates, readmission rates, average length of stay, overtime, sick time, turnover, and staff injuries, as well as hours per patient day and cost per patient day and uh, the fiscal impact. And post-implementation surveys as well, which uh, didn't make our list there, but uh, certainly will be a part of our evaluation. 
So I guess just to recap, we did have to invest in this process um, before we get any returns. And our investment, uh, we gave time and lieu to staff who were coming in to attend meetings of the project committee and any of our education sessions that were set up. Um, orientation and implementation costs for 13 LPNs uh, occurred over about an eight to 10 week period. Um, and then uh, the implementation of the collaborative care guidelines, the printing of that, and the collaborative care nurse assignment role. Uh, that nurse will sometimes, that is her assignment, is to collaborate with these new staff, maybe LPNs, RRNs, um, but she may also have a light assignment as well. The return on investment, the savings we're hoping will be mostly related to uh, return from uh, less money spent on overtime. Um, perhaps sick time. We have 12 LPNs up there right now practicing to full scope in levels uh, two and one, so that's intermediate and transitional care areas. Um, we are continuing to build capacity and, and advance the practice of the interprofessional team. And the next slide talks about the financial impact of all RN versus RN LPN model of care delivery. And as you can see, the most significant impact saving is in salaries uh, with potential savings in overtime and sick time. Recognizing, though, that we do have a difference in the scope of practice. Um, and there is a collaborative practice design there now. Um, and then the orientation needs for the LPN are a bit different than for the RN. So there is ongoing development with this process as well. There's opportunities for staff education. There's evaluation of scope of practice for all disciplines, providing care in NICU, and so that's ongoing. Evaluation of scope of employment for non-professional members of the team, so that's looking at the work that everyone is doing to see if we're optimizing what they can be doing. Um, there's standardized care plans um, that we'll be piloting there. Um, there's activities for improved work relations. There's streamlining and improving unit processes. So this work is ongoing. So we talked about those four change levers of people, process, information, and technology. So what we've discussed today is mainly the people quadrant and one aspect of the people quadrant, but there's certainly work going on in the other quadrants as well. We're look, we have to look at access to technology that best supports care delivery, effective communication, and updating and reviewing the, the NICU population data. And we're quite lucky in that our decision support group has been very involved with that. And we have um, a de what we call a data cube, which is um, an Excel spreadsheet um, that we're able to compare our data. And they'll be updating that on a regular basis so we can keep a, um, a close eye on our data to see what's changing, what changes that means for our NICU. And that is the end of the presentation, except for questions. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, and this, is, uh, this will give me an opportunity to remind everyone that it, you can answer, uh, ask questions by just typing the question into the question box on the right-hand side. Um, right now, we, do, we haven't had any questions come in yet. Um, so we'll hopefully uh, people are sort of thinking about something and ruminating a bit, and uh, we'll have a few questions come in, in, the, in within the next few seconds. But if there's any other comments from any of the, of the panel, or Alan, yourself, or Elaine, or anyone, feel free to, to make a comment now. Um, it's Jocelyn speaking. I, um, I'll just add a couple of comments. Heather and Kate have made it sound um, very easy, <laughs> and, uh, and, they, and they made it look easy, too. But I, as you can imagine, with a, a change initiative that is all about people, <clears throat> face time with people um, and really spending lots of time getting people to speak about all their hard questions. What were their fears? What did they see the opportunities being? But oftentimes that needs to be done any number of times and especially for folks who are having a particularly difficult time um, engaging with it. So trying to involve those folks even more so that they're able to learn as we go you know, what, what are the pros and cons of the changes that we're making. So that, I think, is one of the key uh, areas of success that our team, uh, Heather and Kate and, and the manager, Kim Thomas, and also uh, a number of frontline leaders within the, uh, 
NICU have been incredibly uh, helpful and supportive in doing that. I'll just mention one other um, challenging situation um, that has been, you know, we've done a lot of work on it, and that relates to our unions. So um, with the IWK, we had our registered nurses in one union and our licensed practical nurses in another. So as you can imagine, it would have been much, much better for us if we could have possibly had those two nursing professionals uh, unified under one union. And we looked at that in depth from a legal point of view and were not able to achieve that. So as a result of that, and we'd be doing it anyway, we do spend a lot of time with our union uh, colleagues. And needless to say, the, the union that is responsible for registered nurses in particular um, does express concerns. So we, we have regular union uh, bargaining unit meetings, et cetera. In addition, uh, for the Provincial Models of Care Initiative in Nova Scotia, there have been quite a few strategies related to helping the union um, understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it. Um, for example, at the annual general meeting of the Nova Scotia Nurses Union a few weeks ago, uh, a whole panel of project leads for models of care from across the province, Heather was there as, as our rep, and a number of the vice presidents of patient care from across the province were there as well in order to give an overview, some education, and really to give people a chance to ask their questions and express what's working and what's not. And there were definitely a variety of perspectives there. But once again, it's really good to get that information out there so that you know, we can address concerns if there are any. Um, and it's an opportunity to share you know, some of the experiences that people have had that have been very positive. And they did speak up about that as well. All right, thanks for that. We have had a few questions come in here. Um, the first question, uh, actually the first two questions are both from Aaron and they're both related to the LPNs. Uh, he's got, he's, the first part of the question is, how was it decided that 13 FTE LPNs was the ideal number? Okay, when we looked at the data, when we looked at patient assignment sheets, uh, and as well as that, um, the additional work that had been done, that title of the project that was done, um, we looked at the care that each patient required and looked at whether it was in the scope of practice of which care provider and then we went with a conservative number from there. So one of those tools told us that at least 40% fit within the scope of practice of an LPN uh, but knowing that we had to start up conservatively because we had to then work um, with the staff and fix anything, I shouldn't say fix anything, work with any bumps in the road to make sure that everything was working well. Uh, we went with the conservative number in regards to the percentage. And if I remember correctly, um, that number was, yeah, I'm just trying to remember what percentage of staff it was. Um, it was under 15% of staff. Um, also a factor so. in the number of LPNs was the fact that many of the 13 LPNs are new graduates, and um, and that was somewhat purposeful on our part, as there's been a relatively new, is it two years, Heather, that we've had a full curriculum at our NSCC, our community college, that integrated a, a number of key components, such as patient assessment and medication delivery. So having those programs fully integrated in the program, we found, was a great help in really producing a graduate that is capable of critical um, thinking and, and better assessment skills. So that was also a factor in the number of people that we could implement at one time. So it was actually 42.37% when we look at, looked at it statistically in regards to that would have been in the scope of the LPN. Um, and uh, I think it was around 13% when we look at assignment-wise that we actually, when we implemented the LPNs that we went with initially and seeing how that works first. All right, and the second part of his question was, are there plans to involve LPNs in level three NICUs? We don't have a plan for that at the moment. Um, I think it's happened, but in a collaborative assignment. So there are pieces of the intensive 
uh, care provision that an LPN could do within their scope, but it would have to be uh, in collaboration with the RN. All right, thanks. Uh, the next question that we've got is from Jean, and she's, uh, she's asking, has there been difficulty doing patient care assignments with LPNs on staff in NICU? At times, yes. Um, usually when we're at really high acuity, when we've reached capacity and um, so we have a high census and high acuity, it becomes more difficult um, to ensure that the assignment um, is somewhat independent or doesn't require a higher degree of collaboration. And of course, if it's at a high census and high acuity, then it's busy for everyone involved. Now, the manager was speaking at the meeting last week and said, we've just come down from a period of high census and high acuity, and things are evening out, and people are getting much more used to everything now. So it's been running much smoother right at the moment. Um, but it, it's had its challenges at times. All right, thanks. Um, our next question uh, is from Pat, one of our local colleagues here in Ottawa. Uh, first, he said, uh, thank you for a thorough presentation. And then she goes on to ask, uh, could you explain the role of the unit aid and how do they support nursing practice? The unit aids in this organization are a support role. So they support um, staff and the unit in regards to functioning. So things such as stocking, um, running, uh, getting equipment, um, cleaning, um, those, those sort of things. So it's a support role in regard to um, supporting the unit and the functioning of the staff. It's not a hands-on role with our clientele. All right, thanks. Um, the next question, uh, also from Jean, uh, was, have you had any grievances by, our, by the RN union for this change? Not in the NICU. <laughs> well, they're, they're laughing because we have uh, a meeting coming up with the bargaining unit uh, group this week, and we do anticipate that it will be um, quite tense. However, uh, all you can do really is face up to it and deal with each thing as it comes up. Um, I think one of the things that's helping us and hopefully reducing potential for grievances are, well, two things that we've done. One is very, very careful vacancy management has been in place for all registered nurse positions for probably two years, a good mm -hmm. solid two years. So we've been very, very careful to take advantage and be strategic about who we hire and how we communicate with any registered nurses that join the organization so that we're, we've been honest. You know, if we, if we anticipate there may be changes in registered nursing staffing, um, we put people in temporary roles and help, and help them understand the decision they were making. So I think our vacancy management strategies have definitely been very helpful because, as you can imagine, one of the major fears of registered nurses is job loss. So we certainly are, I think, um, really, really doing a great job of that. And ongoing communication with the union, um, really uh, connecting well. We have a shop steward who actually has a, a small portion of her FTE that is funded by the organization in order to spend significant amount of time uh, with us to help understand where the dynamics are. All right, and for the next question, we're going out west to, to Regina, where uh, Sharon is asking, can you explain how HPPD is calculated? Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> the, there are two ways that HPPD is calculated. One way is from our workload tool. We have an online Emerald workload tool, which we implemented about a year and a half, two years ago. We had the old paper-based system before that. so through the times that are uh, collected by registered nurses and licensed practical nurses, and, and all of our allied health professionals collect the data as well, um, we are able to see how, much, how many hours per patient day are captured for patient care. So that's one method of calculating it. Another way is a financial method. So that's basically looking at all of your RN staff that you've paid and then, uh, you know, dividing that by the number of patient days you have. And that's another way of verifying what your numbers are. And, of course, 
they can be somewhat different because your financial HPPDs would include overtime and sick time replacement and that sort of thing. So we, we look at both of those numbers. Well, we whipped through that uh, initial list of uh, questions uh, quite uh, quickly and efficiently. Um, so that was some. That was a great discussion. I think we might have a few more questions come in, but uh, and again, if there's any comments from the panel, Elaine has a comment she'd like to put in. So over to, to you, Elaine. Yeah, I, I think that I, I want to actually um, pose a question or two, and I just want to add to um, Jan Robertson's uh, comment. It was an excellent presentation, and and uh, my thanks to all again. From a um, so this falls under a bit of culture, but also process, sort of going back to the original consultation and, and, um, and sort of fact-finding process at the beginning. Where were, or what was the role of your families, if, if at all, and, um, and specifically your physician colleagues? The physician, there was uh, physician colleagues uh, as part of the interprofessional team. So they were a part of the group. Um, so they were involved as part of the team uh, and had input. If they couldn't make it, often would send comments to the uh, meetings um, and have been involved in discussions and, uh, in, and actually in looking at evaluation and um, how things have been going. Family, we use their fa uh, family survey. Um, and we certainly, our communication board in regards to model care was in one of the main hallways, which both staff and families uh, could read. And so certainly if there's any discussions or questions that came forward from families, they were addressed. But I don't recall any. We uh, didn't do focus groups as such. No. We, we did, yeah, we have done some family focus groups. There were some done uh, for the provincial design of the model. And we have done some family focus groups in various places within our organization in order to understand family perspectives. One of the things, and Kate and Heather will uh, correct me if I've gone off on a, on a sidetrack here, but one of my observations is that I think families feel confident in who's providing care if we demonstrate that we feel confident in who's providing patient care. I think that's one of the most important elements in terms of a, a positive implementation. So the concerns of families I didn't I don't find are particularly profound. They're they're not focusing on whether it's a licensed practical nurse or a registered nurse for the most part. The, there was initial focus groups when we started looking at model care here at the IWK, and we had focus groups both within our Women's and Newborn Health Program and within our Pediatrics Program. And what we heard back from those focus groups at that time was they really didn't care because we were concerned they would they were used to primary care and would not like multiple care providers involved in the care. But that's not what we heard at the time. Basically, what we heard from them at the time was we don't care how many or who they are as long as we get the care we need was the message we got back from them. And certainly um, there was a provincial evaluation of the initial showcase units for that particular framework, the provincial framework. And there was numerous focus groups, interviews, and questionnaires that went out to patients and family throughout the province in regards to the model and the implementation model. Um, and for feedback, and so there was definitely feedback received from them in regards to changing models, and it was a positive outcome. The other thing to add is that we really have kept a focus on the potential for fragmentation of care from the outset, because of course, you know, that, that could have a negative impact from a family perspective and from a patient care perspective. So in planning assignments, you know, the, the one or two nurses who are involved in the main, in the main assignment are, are both introducing themselves and explaining a bit about how they work together and break coverage, lunch coverage, that sort of thing. So we're really working on trying to reduce churn and make sure that people know who's, who's working with their patient uh, or their family member. I'll also mention that going back to your how did physicians uh, become involved, We've also spent quite a bit of time at our senior physician leadership um, uh, venues. I've done numerous 
uh, presentations and held ongoing discussions, really, um, with our medical advisory committee, with our medical, dental, and scientific staff, um, and also with each of the departments. So, for example, the Department of Ob Obs and Gynae, the Department of Pediatrics, etc. And typically, if there is any major changes going on, we really do spend quite a bit of time with physicians to help them understand. Um, if there are a lot of anxieties in frontline staff, those things can bubble up to physicians and create worries there. So we really try to keep those loops working and very open. The other thing we did for communication of families <coughs> is a lot of our areas have information for families on who their team consists of. And so, of course, with the implementation of new care providers, We've updated those materials for families that describe the new care provider as well. Excellent. Absolutely. I, that, that was a fantastic answer. And I, you know what, I, I think your point, um, and I think Jocelyn, you first made it, is that our families, and, and I think it's our number one obligation to our families, of course, is to provide the very best care and 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 all of all of you know what comes with that. And and uh, so I, I really, really appreciated that um, that response. Thank you. I'll just make one more comment um, with regard to the work that we're launching in uh, our mental health and addictions program. So one of the things that we discovered when we really started looking at the patient data and the staffing data in our mental health and addictions program, we do have a very high number, high ratio of assistive level personnel versus um, not versus, but in combination with professionals. So in the mental health and addictions area, we do anticipate uh, further strengthening, and we've already done quite a bit of strengthening the uh, clinical teams with health professionals, licensed practitioners such as uh, Master of Social Work, nursing, et cetera. So in mental health and addictions, we anticipate uh, a bit of a reverse from the dynamic that we discussed here. So I just thought you may be interested in that. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm hoping it will help with our union meeting this week. <laughs> <laughs> so too. <laughs> yeah, we did have one more uh, question come in related to uh, will the uh, power will, will the, the PowerPoint slides be available? And uh, I believe they will be. Um, I did pop back up on the screen the information on how you can get in touch with us at CAFC and the uh, website links where you can find this information posted. Uh, specifically this presentation as well as all of the information, any other resources that we might have like PowerPoint slides, et cetera, uh, will be posted on the Knowledge Exchange Network, which you can see there at uh, ken.cafc.org. And uh, since this is a, a relatively new uh, series of webinars, it, it doesn't have a dedicated section, but you'll find it in the other category. Uh, you'll find all of the financial leaders uh, uh, networks, uh, webinars uh, in the other category. So you can either browse that or use the search bar and search for uh, for the title of this uh, presentation. I'll, I'll also add uh, a plug for CAFC, although there are many to give. One of the things that we did a couple of years ago, actually when CAFC was here in Halifax, is Heather and I hosted a lunchtime session, and a fairly informal and invited our colleagues from across the country to come and talk with us and, and uh, hear what we were doing. But uh, I think we learned more about what was working and what was very challenging in other organizations. So that was incredibly valuable. And, um, you know, so I'm just mentioning that as, a, as an excellent tool for dialogue. I, I, certainly, I certainly appreciate that comment. Thank you for that. And that really is what we... In, in essence, they're all about, and that really is sharing best practices, um, improving on practice where, where, where there are need, and, and really that information is led and, and, and brought forward by, by you, by the many uh, clinical leaders, um, uh, financial leaders who are on the telephone right now, um, and that really, is, um, that really is a continued commitment in terms of uh, providing that uh, knowledge sharing opportunities and thank you for that comment though. It doesn't look like there are any more questions. There, there's a minute or two um, if, uh, if anyone joining us from across the country would like to ask a final question or two. And wrapping things up, 
Um, I want to really begin by thanking uh, Kim Thomas and Kate Lively and Heather Simons, as well as our chair of the Financial Network, Alan Horsborough, all from all our all colleagues from the IWK, an outstanding, practical, so well articulated uh, presentation. Um, the advantage that Doug and I have from the CAPC National Office is that we can see the list of all participants, and I can reassure everyone, first of all, we want to say hello to all of our colleagues from across the country, but in addition to that, today's call was uh, represented by delegates representing both clinical, financial, administrative, really there was a truly interprofessional representation on the call, and I think to our IWK colleagues that really speaks to the high relevance of uh, what you had to share, and I could just feel the learning that was ongoing. Um, we will get, um, I will ask for the final uh, presentation from our IWK colleagues to be sent to Doug um, so that we can get the one that you presented today up on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, I want to, uh, to thank Doug, as always, for his uh, technical leadership as well as uh, the many, many, many uh, roles that he plays within, within CAFC. Um, as Alan mentioned at the start of our webinar today, um, we will, this is a series, and today was just uh, the second webinar of our series. This is going to be ongoing for what I believe will be um, a number of years to come. Um, I want to put out an invitation to those of us who are still on the line, first of all, spread the word, share this particular theme with your colleagues in your respective organizations, and please be comfortable and feel free to let Alan or myself know um, what topics you might like to bring to this venue. And uh, we would be happy to, um, to have you present at future, future webinars. The next one will be in September of this year a month or so before CAFC's annual meeting. Um, I think just in, in, in ending, um, sharing best practices falls in many areas and involves a large professional community uh, from across um, the country, from our, across our CAFC community. And, um, and again, I, I'd ask everyone to think out of the box and bring um, practices and changes and, and um, opportunities that have really made a difference within your respective organizations, uh, please feel comfortable and come and share those with the CAFC community. Um, Alan, uh, for the last word, I'm going to turn to you. All right. Um, we will send our emails in the final version as well in case anyone would like to follow up with more particulars on this uh, particular initiative. But I just again want to reiterate what Elaine said. Please send us your ideas and thank you to our IWK team here for a fantastic presentation and thank you everyone for joining in to uh, participate. Thanks, Alan. Bye-bye, everybody.